It's hump day, y'all. Time to get your fix of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show with your host, the one and only Chris Pritchard. Hello, everybody. First up, listen, right? It's hump day, so that means giveaway because hump day and giveaway rhyme. I thought we'd do a giveaway today. Okay, we'll get into that shortly. First, let's have a little transition and then we'll get into the show, all right? Ish. All right, before we get into the news news, I've got a bit of a bone to pick, all right? So up in Newcastle, at the start of stage four of the Tour of Britain, I was subjected to what, let's call it what it is, a voyeurism. And Andrew, listen, that's fine. If that's what you're into, that's fine. But what worried me more was a message he sent me, which said, my girlfriend was laughing because normally when I'm watching cycling, yours is the only channel she watches with me, which I, you know, I take that as a compliment until she said this and I quote, he's just a pleb. That's why I like him. I mean, listen, if I'm hitting the, the female demographic simply because I'm a pleb, then so be it. I don't care. I'll be a pleb all day long. Thanks, Andrew's girlfriend. Really appreciate that comment. Unbelievable. Right, let's get straight on with the news. And first up, let's talk about Rigoberto Uran. Had to abandon stage six of La Vuelta due to a horrendous crash. Nobody got any of the footage of the crash. However, it did sound like when they spoke to the riders that it was a massive crash. And what I didn't realise is the amount of injuries Rigoberto Uran sustained. Now, during the original reporting of this, we found out that he'd suffered multiple injuries, but to what extent, we, we never fully understood. Now, last week, he posted on his Instagram saying he was waiting for his lung to deflate to be able to do the operations that he needed. He went on then to say how hard the days have been, but he's received so much love and so many prayers, and, and he thanked everybody that had sent them. So not only did Rigoberto Oran sustain a fractured collarbone, he also fractured several ribs, as well as his shoulder blade, and ultimately puncturing a lung, which has caused that long wait on those operations that is needed. So he's had to wait for his lung to, to repair before he could have the operations. He then took to Instagram again after he'd had the operation, saying he'd been on the operating table for seven hours. But now the operations are done, it looks like he can get well on his way to recovery. It sounds, from what the doctors were saying, that he is lucky to be alive after he sustained the injuries he did on stage six, which, I mean, it's just terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying, especially what we've seen over the past few weeks as well. So we send our well wishes to Rigoberto. He don't watch the show, but I just feel it's a nice thing to do just to say, hey, Rigo, we're thinking of you, mate. Get well soon, chief. Next up and talking about injuries, I should put some sort of warning on this video, but check this video out. Now, before I was going to report on this story, I'd not seen the footage of this and I was going to say, do you know what? Let's reserve judgment because we don't know what happened here and it would be unfair to, to, to say, right, let's, let's lynch this, not lynch him, not lynch him, but let's find out who this man is and bring him to justice. Uh, but then when you see the footage of it, you realise, what a knob, what an absolute bell end. I mean, first and foremost, why, why is he not riding on the road? So... Let me tell you the story. Freddie Lee Simmons Fletcher was riding his bicycle with his three siblings, mum and her friend, on the way home from school on Friday when he was hit by the dickhead. It doesn't say that in there, but that's what I'm calling him. Now look at that poor lad's face. Why ride off? You were clearly not paying attention, were you? Whoever you are, cyclist, you were clearly not paying attention when you did it. And then to have the audacity to get up and just carry on your ride. How dare you? How dare you actually it's probably a good job he rode off because if that was my son they'd done that too speaking to the press the youngster's dad said he had to be taken to hospital in an ambulance for treatment and now has two black eyes and he's struggling to eat he is in so much pain with his face which is really sore his eyebrow had to be glued and he has a big cut from under his left eye as well as bruising clearly that man doesn't have kids 
And if he does, he should be ashamed of himself. Let's move on from this story. It's boiling my blood. Leave comments down below. Let's just try and find out who he is. Let's share the story about and, um, and see if we can find out who he is and, and actually get his explanation as to why he decided to ride off after smashing into a young five-year-old kid, leaving him on the floor with facial injuries. Talking of facial injuries, the City of London are asking for help identifying this cyclist who thought it would be a good idea to headbutt a pedestrian. This is CCTV footage of the incident. I'll be honest, I don't know who's in the right and who's in the wrong here. I mean, clearly the cyclist gets himself into the wrong later on, but from this, it looks like the green light is on for the traffic coming from the right of the shot, but they can only turn right because it's got a right turn underneath the traffic light, so people can't turn left here. So that must mean that this pedestrian here would have been allowed to, to cross the road. Where the cyclist coming through from, I'm not exactly sure. If he's come straight on, that means he's gone through a red light. If he's come from the left, right-hand side of the shot, that means he's illegally turning left when the, the, the road sign is telling him to go right. Anyway, let's play it through. As you can see there, getting close together. Boo, close. And then for some reason, the cyclist decides to, to confront him. He's telling him it looks like it's green. And then he just, I don't think I've used the word knobhead this many times in his show. But what the hell? Like, even, even if the pedestrian was in the wrong and the cyclist had the right of way, just carry on. Just call him a knobhead. I've done it again. And then just carry on, on your way. Again, this is it's bloody turning into crime watch, this programme today. Do we know who that cyclist is? Can we identify him? Apart from just being a dick on a bike. Um, if you can, leave your comments down below. We'll, um, we'll go all Rav Wilding on his bum and, uh, and bring him to justice. Justice served with Chris Pritchard. Eesh. All right, next up, let's talk about Rowan Dennis. There's been a lot of radio silence from him ever since he abandoned stage 12 of the Tour de France back in the summertime. But he has broke that silence recently in an interview with the Adelaide Advertiser. Now, for those of you who need bringing up to speed, he abandoned stage 12 of the Tour de France one day prior to an individual time trial, which he was more than capable of winning. Um, when he originally abandoned, no one really knew why he'd abandoned. Nothing was said from him or the team. And for a good, what, two hours, he, he just went missing. No one actually knew where he was, such was this weird abandonment. It wasn't a usual one where, you know, it's pre-planned and they don't take part in the stage at all, or they get injured halfway through the stage, or they suffer a crash through the stage and they just have to abandon. This was him just deciding, hey, I've had enough of this. And no one really knew why he'd quit, and then rumours started circulating that that potentially he'd quit because he'd had a massive bust up with the team management of Bahrain Merida. He was unhappy with the equipment that he was going to have to use in the individual time trial and he felt that it was going to be a hindrance to him rather than an advantage using their equipment. And, and it just sounded like that was, that was the whole story. He was mad, he was upset, he'd thrown a bit of a hissy fit and he just decided that he didn't want to race. That was it. The team didn't come out and give us a valid reason. Then Rowan Dennis just shut down and went on silence and, and we never really knew the full story behind it and we never knew the true meaning of that abandonment until now. And I say that, he still doesn't really explain why he decided to abandon, but he does say it was blown out of all proportion. In the interview, he said it wasn't pre-planned, it wasn't a stunt. I was talking to my manager before the start and we agreed on finishing the stage and dealing with everything else after but I knew that by pulling out in the short term, I'd have to deal with some shit, some backlash. I didn't expect it to be this big because it's a bike race, but long term, it was the best thing for me to do. The whole stage I was thinking about everything and it was a battle in my own head for a fair chunk of the day. And if someone is not in the right headspace in a team environment, if someone is not happy, maybe it's the best thing for the team. And I spoke to the guys at the hotel that night and there were no hard feelings. Now when the story broke, as you'd expect in this world of social media, there were a lot of people jumping on Rowan Dennis's bike, calling him a diva, telling him he was unprofessional, just giving him a real hard time as to why he'd quit. And people basically saying it was unacceptable. He had a job to do, he had a contract, and he should have just done it as he was told to do. And to be honest, part of me was thinking that, but also we reported on Jack Bobridge a few months ago, and Jack Bobridge has been arrested for supplying ecstasy. And this guy, bearing in mind, was uh, or is a silver medalist in the Olympics. 
He was the our world record holder for a short period of time, and he was one of the greatest team pursuiters ever. Uh, and his demise is just, I, well, it's just a shame. But as I mentioned before, let's reserve judgment on this person because we don't know what's going on in their life. We don't know what's led them to that point. And it's similar to Rowan Dennis. Yes, it's easy to call him a diva. Yes, it's easy to say, just crack on with your job. If I was in that position, I wouldn't do that. And as cycling fans, it's difficult to watch these cyclists get upset, get marty when they've literally got the world at their feet when they've got the best equipment in the world for, for as, as far as we can see and they've also got the best job in the world they get to travel the world they get to ride the bike and ultimately what looks like they have a lot of fun doing it but i've seen it there's a lot of pressure involved in this there's a lot of pressure on these riders not only to perform uh, for the team but also in the media also with the fans and it must be a really hard job to make sure that mental well-being is as looked after as your physical well-being. I'm reserving my judgment just a little bit because I feel that maybe that's what Rowan Dennis is going through. Maybe he is having mental well-being issues that he just needs to sort out because he's just employed a sports psychiatrist to help him build up towards Yorkshire Worlds and also Tokyo. So maybe there was some underlying issues there that he needed to sort out. And he felt that in that moment, that was all he could do. And, and if that's the case, then who are we to judge? Like it's unfair that we should put pressure on him to, to carry on his job when he's suffering from from mental health issues. However, I say I've reserved judgment just a little bit because later in that report he goes on to say that for the World Championships in Yorkshire he's going to be riding an unmarked bike with components supplied by the Australian cycling team. So you can't help thinking that May, I don't know, maybe it was mental health issues and, 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 and that's fair enough, let's not judge him. However, if it was the fact that he feels that the equipment is, is inferior, then, then, well, tough. That's the team you signed for and you knew what components you were going to be riding on and if that wasn't good enough for you, then you shouldn't have signed that contract. All right, so let me pass the question off to you. Like, what do you think to that whole Rowan Dennis abandoning stage 12? Do you believe that it was down to equipment issues and he wasn't happy with the team and the team management? Bearing in mind that it looks like he's going to be riding for Bahrain Merida in 2020. Uh, and if that's the case, do you think he should be allowed to be able to use an unmarked bike with components supplied by Australian cycling team if he's not promoting any other brands? Or do you think, well, like everybody else, they're all going to be riding their, their team issue kit? So, so should he, I don't know. All right, it's the hump day giveaway. I've got a feeling I'm gonna regret that because now it feels like we should do a giveaway every week. And I've been trying to do a giveaway every week, but I'm running out of stock. So, um, hey, the best thing you can do is make sure you go and purchase what I'm about to show you if you don't win it, or at least some products from that range. Can you do that for me, please? Thanks. Right, I'm gonna give away to one lucky viewer Yes. It's the Muckoff Ultimate Bike Cleaning Kit, um, which I think I'm going to use as a toolbox as well once I've uh, once I've used it. But hey, Pritch, why don't you tell us what's in there? Yes. Hello and welcome. And first, can I just say, Chris, that you really are truly an amazing gentleman to be able to give away such high quality products, sometimes at your own cost as well. It's just well. You're like a modern day Jesus. But without further ado, let's get into the Muck Off box, the ultimate cleaning bike kit. And here's what you can win in this prize. First up, Muck Off High Performance Waterless Wash, a microfiber cloth, bike cleaner concentrate, Muck Off's Drive Chain Cleaner, Muck Off Fast Action Bike Cleaner. Some of these, three of these. My favorite, Wet lube and everybody else's favorite an expanding microcell sponge amongst the cleaning product is also various different brushes what an amazing prize Pritchard you really are the best back to you in studio all right and if you want to be in with a chance of winning this all you've got to do well normally we just get you to leave a positive comment on a post that's all good and well, but I wanted to I wanted to give you something more to do, but I couldn't quite think of anything. So there's three things you need to do. They're all simple things and they're all things you can do right now to make sure you're entered for this. First off, you gotta be subscribing to the channel. If you're not, you ain't gonna win this. You've gotta hit that like button, all right? Hit that like button, and then all you've gotta do is then leave a nice positive comment, spreading some love 
in the channel. Do all that, you might stand a chance of winning this. Do it now. All right then, let's get up to date with all the racing news from today. Again, as a spoiler alert, if you've not seen the races, either the Tour of Britain or the Vuelta, then, I don't know, go and watch it and then come back and find out my opinion on it all. But I'll tell you one thing, I chose the wrong race to watch today. I had the Tour of Britain on for the majority of the day while I've been editing. And oh my God, La Vuelta, what a stage. Stage 17 was supposed to be a flat stage, it was supposed to be a sprint, it was supposed to be a transition stage, it was supposed to be one of those stages where the GC riders essentially get another day off. But they didn't. Right, let's go back to the start of the stage. And the order of the day was crosswinds. Prior to the stage starting, everybody was talking about how the crosswinds could play a huge part in this stage. And it might not necessarily just be a straight run in to the line. As usual, with a sprint stage, a break goes away. The sprinters' teams then line it out, catch the break, everybody sprints, Sam Bennett wins. But that's not the case. It wasn't necessarily a break that went, just a huge massive split in the peloton. From there, Jumbo Visma wanted to try and control the race, so they let their riders go back from that break into the main peloton. This front group at this point had 47 riders up front and it was literally just, uh, it was just like a massive time trial, just absolutely smashing it to pieces. And 140 kilometers to go, they had more than a four minute lead. 132 kilometers, Jumbo Visma realized this was gonna be a tough day and they were gonna have to work very, very hard to maintain their gap because one man in particular that was in that group up front was Nairo Quintana. Yes, he was six minutes behind, but with crosswinds, literally anything could happen, and they had to mark that man and make sure that they tried to close that gap down and not give him too much of an advantage. And then 10 kilometers later, that gap went up beyond five minutes, and it put Nairo Quintana back on the podium. Now, was it yesterday or the day before that I'd said that this La Vuelta is pretty much over now? Rodlich is gonna win. Alejandro Valverde is happy with second place and really the only fight is going to be between Pogacar and Miguel Angel Lopez for the white jersey in the final position on the podium. Not anymore. Quintana's back up there. Now down to 89 kilometers and that gap is still going up on that front group. More riders are getting shelled out the back but the ones who are strong enough to stay in there, they're increasing that lead over the main peloton. And as the race went on, more and more echelons were being made, more and more people were going out the back. And then lo and behold, the good old movie star tactics came into play again. Now I understand why they did this, but still it must be so frustrating for Quintana. If Valverde was up there, they would have shut it down, they wouldn't have done any work. But the fact that Quintana was up there meant they still had to chase that break back down. And at 47 kilometers, movie star are on the front with Valverde working hard to bring that down, even though they've got a rider up there who can now make it potentially a second and a third for movie star on the podium. But no, we don't want that. Let's close that down and spoil his day again. And to be fair, it's probably the right thing to do. Quintana hasn't shown the form that Valverde has been showing on the climb. So maybe as soon as they start going uphill again, Quintana's just gonna get cracked and lose all that time. But you never know. People have been known to get second wins in tours and get stronger towards the end. And Quintana has been, you know, he's, he's proven that, that he can get stronger as the, the tour goes on. And then at 35 kilometers, there was only 20 riders in that Rodlich group, which would, I guess you'd consider the main peloton now with the red jersey in it. And it was Astana working on the front now, trying to close that gap. Obviously they are off the podium as it stands. Down to 16 kilometers now, and you can see there, perfect example of those echelons, perfect example of all those riders having to pull through. And one thing James Knox said, in an interview after the race is it creates a much more cohesive group at the front here because you've got those crosswinds and echelons have to be formed it's harder to sit at the back and do no work so it's, it's actually encouraging you to come through and do some work which in effect gets a much more cohesive group going everyone's doing their turn everybody's working as hard as they should be and no one's really taking any taking it easy at the back because if they were they'd be out the back this group had spent more than 200 kilometers in a break and it was definitely going to stay away with 6.2 kilometers they had a five minute gap over the Rodlich group it was clear that it was going to come down to this group to decide the winner of today's stage and one kilometer to go Yannick Stebar took the advantage and tried to break the rest of the group which played into the hands perfectly of the eventual winner Phil Gill making it 11 Grand Tour stage wins now Sam Bennett was up there and obviously he would have been the favorite had it come down to 
a, a regular sprint stage, people doing what they normally do in terms of a sprint stage, he definitely would have been favourite. He still finished second. However, I feel that the amount of time that they all spent in that breakaway, that he just worn himself out so much. And when you're racing against someone like Philippe Gilbert, got to wake up on the right side of bed to beat that boy. And unfortunately for Sam Bennett, he didn't. Fortunately for Gilles Phil Gilville, fortunately for Gilville, Phil Gilles, he took the victory. And Phil Gilbert managed to put two seconds into the majority of that break right at the end there. Great result for him. And in terms of GC now, it's got a completely different look about it. Primoz Roglic still up there in first position. Again, like I've said, it's going to take something disastrous for him to not win this now. But the, the, the inter-team competition between Quintana and Valverde. Don't forget, Quintana's going to leave for Arkea Semsic at the end of the year. So I guess everyone that's staying at Movistar will have Alejandro Valverde's back more so than him. But it's going to make it interesting to see what happens over the next couple of days with them. It's not going to be as clear-cut as it was before yesterday when Quintana was down in 5th, 6th position and he wasn't fighting for that podium. He's now in 2nd position, 2 minutes and 24 behind Primoz Rodlich. Alejandro Valverde is 2 minutes and 48. So there's only a small gap between Quintana and Valverde. Tajet Pogacar is now in 4th position, 3 minutes and 42 behind Rodlich. And then Miguel Angel Lopez, 3 minutes and 59. So that fight for that white jersey is still red hot it's going to go all the way down to the wire that one but in terms of the other two spots on the podium i would love to see just to stick it to, to movie star i would love to see quintana get stronger and stronger as this goes on with a couple of mountain stages still to go everything's to play for and if he can find the form that he had back in the tour de france it, he's not looked very sharp these first two weeks but if he can find the form there's every chance that that he could be fighting for a podium spot come madrid but one thing's for sure I will be tuning in to Love Welter tomorrow to see exactly what happens. All right, let's talk about the Tour of Britain. And this morning in the interviews, Matthew van der Poel was unsure as to whether he was going to maintain that green jersey come the end of stage five. It was a relatively fat stage. It had all the hallmarks of what was going to be a bunch sprint in the end. But he was unsure as to whether he was going to maintain that jersey because Matteo Trentin was only one second behind. And with the time bonuses that you could receive at the end of the stage, it was a toss-up between whether... Corinden Circus should work really, really hard to try and get Matthew van der Poel to the finish and get him to win that sprint. However, if he didn't win the sprint, there was a good chance he wasn't going to be in that green jersey. I think Corinden Circus came to a decision that they were going to work, but they weren't going to fully commit to this just in case he didn't win the sprint at the end. It looked more of a sprint suited to Dylan Groenewegen than it did to Matthew van der Poel, especially with the form that Groenewegen's on at the minute. If it was going to come down to a sprint, there was a there was a high chance that he was going to win it. So that meant that if, if Matthew van der Poel didn't win, then Matteo Trentin could be right there to pick up the pieces and get himself back in that green jersey. And then we've got the time trial tomorrow, which is really going to sort the men from the boys out. And it's going to put bigger time gaps in than what they were fighting for today. It was it, They were fighting for a couple of seconds here and there. So if Matthew van der Poel had committed his whole team, knackered them all out in this stage for what? Just to maintain the jersey for a second... He could potentially have lost all that time and more tomorrow in the time trial. Or on the other hand, could have gained a bigger advantage at the time trial, which meant his men would have been a bit fresher to maintain that jersey for the last few stages. And ultimately, it did come down to a bunch sprint, but we didn't see Jumbo Visma on the front with like 2 or 3k to go like you normally see when it comes to a sprint like that. They held their cards back. They sat back and they pretty much did nothing. Then all of a sudden, five, 600 metres to go, it must have been Turnison, took Grunewigen to the front. And that was all she wrote. Grunewagen did today what Matthew van der Poel did yesterday to everybody and made everybody look pretty much useless. <laughs> he flew straight past them. He won the sprint. Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. And then because Matteo Trentin took third position, he got some bonus seconds, which meant he goes back into green for tomorrow's time trial. So there's a stage classification there. You can see Matt Walls from the Great Britain cycling team. He was only just behind Groenewegen. It does say zero gap, but mm, there was a little more than it. it. It looked a little bigger than that. Matteo Trentin finished third and Cease Ball. He was fourth position for Team Sunweb and Chimalaya was fifth for the Israeli Cycling Academy. Pretty consistent there for, for Chimalaya. In the general classification, Matteo Trentin takes the lead and puts in three seconds into Matthew van der Poel now. And Jasper de Burst 
is 10 seconds behind Simon Clark, 17 seconds, and Mike Turnison, 18 seconds. So it's all still to play for, really. They're, they're, any one of those riders in that top five can potentially win this. And the time trial tomorrow will start putting bigger gaps in for those GC contenders, and we'll get to see who really is on that form. Thanks for watching, everybody. Now's my opportunity to tell you tomorrow there will be no Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show because we are streaming the first race of the, let's call it the winter season. I'll be streaming tomorrow night around 6 p.m. British time. Make sure you've hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you know when we go live with my live streams tomorrow. It's gonna hurt, it's gonna suck, but I need to do it. I need to get my first race under my belt at some point. So please come and join me. Please come and show me some encouragement and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Eesh.